All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Philip Roberts, extension entomologist located here in Tifton, and myself and Dr. Jason Schmidt, and uh, we're going to kind of tag team today and, and talk about insects and insect pest management. Uh, we're going to let Dr. Schmidt go first. Uh, he works primarily in biome control, a little more on the research side, a great speaker, has some really interesting things, so I hope. I hope so too. And, uh, but, uh, but uh, uh, we'll just go ahead and get started. And if you have questions, just stop, Jason. Or, or we hope to have questions, you know, some time at the end of the, the session to have you know, questions for him. All right, Dr. Smith. Well, good morning. Um, and I want to share a few things uh, today. That the storyline. Um, one of the things that we're working on in my lab right now has to do with conservation and conservation of biocontrol. And I think that we're quite fortunate um, in the United States and in America um, with the types of uh, land that we have out in our system, and in particular in Georgia. And the National Geographic, I don't know if you've seen this, um, this particular National Geographic series that's posted right now on uh, Disney Plus, but it goes through and hits all these little areas around the United States um, to, show, um, to show that beauty. And one piece of it that doesn't get as much, by the way, this, this image right here is pretty awesome. It was taken over a, like a 44 hour period, 33 shots or something all collapsed together to form a composite of what that landscape looked like at that time. Pretty cool. I'm not that good at photography, so. But anyway, um, one thing that is usually lacking from those views of the, you know, the great, you know, U.S. or other things, is uh, often the, the insects. <laughs> insects often don't get that picture because often we're thinking about insects as something that we, you don't want crawling around in our bed. We don't want, uh, you know, crawling around our fields or eating our crops. And, but there are also uh, quite a few beneficial uh, insects out there that are worth conserving, and. In the last couple of years, there's been uh, quite a few folks kind of bringing the, the body of knowledge on uh, biodiversity and importance together. And I just wanted to share um, a little bit of some of the take-homes that they, that they found and put together for this. Now, this is for Europe. And I will say one thing about comparing Europe to the United States. One is, is that Europe, they're always constrained on much smaller fields. Whereas here, we have a lot more arable land that we can potentially farm. However, there are some similarities, especially in Georgia, that I hope you see, and I'll bring that um, at the end, and that is, even though we have a large amount of space, we also have to farm within kind of complex areas. That is, there's a lot of riverways, there's areas we can't farm on, there's marginal areas that are very challenging to farm on, and so therefore, we have to choose field sizes that we can farm within those that are best productive. And part of that also has a conservation um, component. So, I just wanted to share these because I found them interesting. The book is much, this book and everything is, is much longer. I think it's about a 200 page or so report on all this. But the take home messages are easy for us to walk through. And there's 12 lessons that they kind of put together on um, insects in agriculture. And one of them is one I think I've talked about before and that is um, that most of the animals on the planet are insects. And Many of them really aren't ones that are uh, problematic for, for humans and human production. And some of them even are really important for boosting uh, pollination and crop management, and we can count on them to do some of that uh, pest management for us. And so that's why we call them uh, beneficial. So those things are exciting for us. Um, another one that they have in here is that relates to this uh, thing that I've talked about um, before for insects and others, and that is this idea of biodiversity or insects as being service providers. So they're not just out there, they're not just you know, insects living there, but they provide services such as cycling in the, uh, in the soil um, of nutrients and making sure those nutrients are available. Here's a good example of, of that. If we didn't have some in Africa, for instance, there's a lot of animals that roam around and produce a lot of dung. Well, if there were dung beetles there to help cycle that dung, it would be a very dumb filled lens. <laughs> so that's extreme. I mean, we don't, we don't, you know, we don't have quite that much dung hanging around in our fields here. But, but it's real. Those service providers are key for making that 
those nutrients then back available uh, for the soil. And same with um, uh, pollinators like bees and there's some flies and whatnot. They're interacting with uh, different flowers around the landscape to make pollination possible. One thing that um, we've moved towards because there is some real obvious farming efficiency in terms of moving around in the fields is often, and especially in, in areas as a good example in Texas cotton, the fields are huge. I've, I've been and I, I look and you look across the landscape and you don't know where the cotton field ends. I don't know how many of you have been and visited those, those cotton landscapes. Very different from here. Very, very different. Um, <clears throat> and um, what has been what has been seen is, is that um, something to do with um, working with this conservation to protect protect insects is probably worth it um, because of all those services they provide. So that's one of their their big findings is that it's probably worth it to conserve insects in the grand scheme of things. One. One buzz phrase that we've heard about um, probably is this idea of organic farming. And the problem in my mind with organic farming is that it gives it a, it gives it a stamp of, all right, it's organic. When I had a student working for me once, I was like, oh cool, we're gonna do all this work in organic. And I took her out and I showed her what an organic system looks like. And she's like, but it's really like, there's so many things going on there. There's not even any soil. They're weeding all the time. Um, they might even have to spray more insecticides or more, uh, more other types of pesticides because they don't have as much control for things that are not the tools. So they spray more often. That means they're going through the fields more often. So I don't think that organic is necessarily the greatest stamp for like, all right, this is a good way to go about conserving things because it's also very intensive. Uh, but that's one, in terms of organic, the one piece of that of that puzzle that is good is that they do use fewer types of pesticides, and two, they often include some type of um, rotation of crops or cover crops, which I've, I've shared with you before, that some of those cover crops and having something in the field provides spaces for, for things to live that are beneficial. There is a new farming thing that some of you might have heard of instead of organic brand is regenerative. Have you heard that phrase? Regenerative farming. And that would, it doesn't necessarily, you don't have to rely on necessarily organic um, stamped approved pesticides and whatnot. It's that you're working with the land to, to allow the land to do what it can on its own. And then we step in and do things when we need to. So they call it more regenerative. Anyway, I kind of like that one better. It's, it's growing. Um, and then it's not as restrictive to OK, you can only use this um, pest control tool. So on number seven, so we're almost done through there. And um, uh, number seven, humans in over 130 uh, countries eat insects. How many in here eat insects on purpose? <laughs> now, we, we probably don't eat insects on purpose all the time, but I do a lot of biking. Like some of my monitoring of what's going on out in the fields is I, we do this biking, and some of you might do it. I ride with, you know, who Don Chase is from the Peanut Commission. I ride with him sometimes, we have meetings. But we ride around the farmlands, um, on our bikes, and we probably eat insects because they're just blowing into our mouth because we're going rise. In this country, we don't do a lot of eating of insects on purpose, but it is in our food. Um, it does show up in our food for sure. But it is a source of a source of food. And an interesting one. Now, my sister works on this because she works in um, Africa. She's in Rwanda right now. She works with um, bringing um, small businesses for women into the market and helping to. You know, make things, make food and whatnot move around the landscape easier. So she's part of that supply chain thing. But women are part of that piece um, as well. This one's a hard one for me. This this one finding here. So I love to eat. Um, I love to eat uh, meat myself. I like hamburgers and I like a steak. And, um, and if you've ever been to Brazil, they just love their meat there. I mean, they, it's amazing. So to eat less meat for me is a is a hard one. But what, it, what, meat, what relying too much on meat as a source does is it takes other land out of production and it's very intensive to, 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 to farm meat. Um, insects can be used though um, as food for, uh, and that's kind of a growing industry right now to actually grow some of these uh, insects. It would be easy to, to farm and then feed them to chickens and pigs and whatnot. 
the last ones here lead into our next thing, and that is um, there are there is evidence of climates are changing, um, and we're seeing shift in, shifts in communities. We're seeing shifts in the distribution of insects and other um, and other animals, and part of that is related to uh, changes in fluctuation and temperatures and variability and how big these storms are, and uh, it's also related to what habitats are available and whether they're vulnerable for maintaining species. The last one here is interesting, um, finding from kind of bringing all these things together, and that is that while we realize, or many realize that, um, you know, there's insects that are worth protecting, in terms of how much we've done across the globe is still pretty low. Um, in terms of protecting um, biodiversity, but it is growing. Um, but around the globe, here's a cool um, kind of image that they put together on where do you see um, different species um, of insects around the world. So this, these bubbles here represent the numbers of different species you find in these areas. So you can see, especially in these regions here, this around that equator area. There's a lot of species hanging out down there. Here's ours, here's ours up in here. We have somewhere in the neighborhood of 120,000 uh, different species. They're at least described. There are probably more and sometimes the, um, last year a student of mine found this little fly um, in peaches. They had never been seen here before. How many, how many years have they been growing peaches and studying peaches and we found this little fly? And it was just because he was really good at looking at things and he found the fly in these samples. He's like, whoa! Um, and we published a little paper on it. But, so these are underestimates, but there is, there is a lot of diversity of things um, around the globe. And there's quite a few things of these different types of insects that are also experiencing some sort of stress. But why does this biodiversity matter, coming back to our picture here? And part of it is directly for um, production. When we think about this for humans, and that is when we have more pollinator species or more natural enemy species, being the predators and parasitoids and pathogens that feed on pests, we tend to get greater levels of pest control and greater levels of pollination. So having more species um, in these areas and finding ways to make that merge with our practices is going to benefit um, those natural services that are out there. And why might that be? Um, one of them is, and I showed this, I don't remember where I showed this before, I didn't show it here, but I used this a few times um, as an example of why diversity might matter. And so, I don't know if you recognize these, but um, these, are, these are beetles, yep. Yep, so these are beetles, and if you look, the, the point here is if you look at their jaw structure here, those jaw structures are different, they're, they're kind of similar. That's one example of mouth parts, but that's just in one group of beetles. And you look over here, and you look at these mouth parts here, pretty different from these. And then this one, I don't know if you recognize this uh, species, not species, but group of organisms there, but it looks like a lepidoptera, yeah? Butterfly, moth type of mouth part. So they have these really long, sort of drinking mouth parts. And you see ones like this? You might, some of you might even know what that, that one is. Assassin bug. Yeah, so it's got like a beak. Look at that thing. That thing looks dangerous. This thing looks a lot less dangerous to me. This looks dangerous. If that bug was that big, I would be a little afraid. <laughs> that thing could pierce you. <clears throat> so part of the reason that um, that diversity then and having that diversity there is we know that there are a lot of things, a lot of different things out there that do cause damage to crops that might require different types of mouth parts to handle. We know that some of the um, Pest insects that are out there have life stages that look different, do different things when they're there. I'll, I'll bring up one little example of white flies. They're weird when they're when they're um, when they're immature. They don't move much. They're tiny. Like you're not going to have a huge beetle with these huge jaws. And the beetle jaws aren't actually this big. Again, I would be scared if I ran into a beetle with six foot uh, mandibles. But the point is, is that they're not going to be really chomping down on little tiny tiny white flies like that, so you need tinier predators there too. You need bigger predators for things like steam bugs. So maybe I've convinced you that probably um, biodiversity does matter, and then how can we go about um, improving? What are some kind of links there? So here's our opportunities. This is why I think, this is why I like being in Georgia, and I think it's like just 
a really interesting spot for conservation. And one of the reasons is, this is a map of um, different waterways uh, throughout Georgia. So you see the larger ones, and then you see all the little tributaries here. So the farmland has to be within there. You cannot set up a farm right in the middle of a waterway. I think that's tricky. And there are some areas in farms, I talked to a few growers, um, you know, in terms of where those tributaries meet, you might have a lower area on the farm and it gets marshy all the time. Those are more difficult to grow than there. Um, so those are the opportunities, those areas within that framework that um, you can't be too productive on, but could be conserved for other things like these beneficials. So I'm just going to say a few things, I'm going to pass it to, um, pass it to the master over here, Philip Roberts. But, um, some of the things, I'll show you just a little bit of data, but um, some of the things on this is uh, kind of planning for conservation. There's a lot of movement of land. That's the other interesting thing about Georgia down here is we're cycling uh, between forestry. Some are doing agroforestry. You have pines that grow really fast. Or in other areas where they're doing um, growing lumber and whatnot, some of those trees take a really, really long time to grow. Whereas here, warm climate, fast growing, um, and so we can harvest those. So agroforestry. Um, mixed with a um, diversity of different crops. But a few correlations of uh, planning for conservation in that cycling of the crops is to try to maintain some uh, smaller field sizes. And I'll give you uh, uh, an indication of that. Some of these are, there are a lot of pretty small field sizes around here. Um, allow for some diversity or potentially um, add diversity of, of plants around the borders and, and near um, those streams to protect from erosion and pro pro promote corridors. This one I don't actually have a graphic on, but pro promote corridors between those habitat areas. So if we had a little patch, so we grow these on, here, here, okay, here's a little strange example that you might get, but um, I don't know, have you seen these little bee boxes that they're um, putting together for urban areas? So that's basically like a, uh, uh, like a birdhouse, but maybe little straws in it, little holes so those bees can go in there. Now, for me, so they, and this last project that I was working on blueberry cores, they're like, you gotta get those out there and put those out in the blueberry fields and in the margins of the blueberry fields. And I look at that little birdhouse, I'm thinking, all right, I'm in the margin of the field, all these spaces where bees could put up their homes. Now, why would a bee come to that little house that I made and, and, and put their nest there when there's all these other places? So that kind of little thing probably works really good in an urban setting. You got nowhere to go there. Where are they going to go? They're going to potentially drill a hole in your house. You're going to find all these little spots in your house where you can give them a little spot where you can, you can find them. But if you just had one of those little bee boxes back to the corridor, and there weren't any other ones for them to move around to, then it's isolated. So connecting those areas so that things can move between those habitats is key. So here's my picture of what some of that conservation can look like. So we have these riverways, allowing for a buffer and allowing things to grow along that buffer to pr protect the land up here that is an arable land doing some crop. This provides an area for conservation and protects from erosion. <clears throat> and the NRCS, I think, puts this at, it should be around 35 feet at minimum from those waterways. Another one is deliberately planting stuff. Um, we're working on this and what to plant becomes the question, how exactly do you do this? When I first got here, the, um, in, what was it, 2015? Wow, so I've been here eight years. I've been here now. So I'm getting close to my end of my 20 minutes, but um, the, uh, the, when I first got here, one of the notions that folks were talking about was, well, it's kind of like the field of dreams. You plant it and they will come. However, if you plant it, the plants may not grow. Um, so you have these seed mixes, and you've probably seen some of the new, all right, so you have the southeast seed mix. All right, so I've planted a number of these now. They tell you what in there, what's on that seed mix. You're not necessarily going to see all those things. Well, why is that? Well, there's so many different soils around Georgia. That's one. Um, and even in the same field, I can go to, that's another interesting thing that I really like about Georgia, but also complicated. You go to one side of the field, it's like sandy. Other side of the field is totally clay. You might have a, a topography where the top 
it's a totally different soil at the bottom. Um, so not all, not everything you get in that sigma is necessarily going to come up because of those different configurations. And then there's even other things to do with the seeds. But, um, but we're working on some of the kind of like finicky things about that. But basically, you can plant those in the ways that, um, like, basically growers know a lot more about doing all the getting plants growing than what what I do. Um, and I work with some in blueberry grow, blueberry uh, fields right now. And we have one grower who's a who's a king at it. He, he was so good. We went out there. We told him some things. And he's like, all right, well, we're gonna do it this way. He tilled it, got it all going. In the first year, we had we had borders that were looking like this, and borders that went up into his blueberry field, and the bees were, were going crazy. So these tools are not hard to use, and folks know how to use them. Now I'm going to give you that correlation, but I'm running out of time here, so maybe I should just give a white flood thing and finish up. Yeah. So there's a there's a correlation between that amount, the size of the field. Pests, how long they would be in the field, and how long it takes them to find the field. And that is, if the field is smaller, it's harder for a pest to find it. Seem kind of logical? And around 40, around 40 acres, 50 acres is probably about a good size. And we have some data on white flies even. When the fields of white flies that we sampled um, got larger, we could find more white fly abundance in those fields. That's just a correlation, it's not cause and effect. Um, we found more cotton in that landscape. We also found more white flies in those fields. And here's the one that's interesting. So this gets back to my conservation. In those landscapes where we sampled, if there were greater numbers of different crops in the landscape, there were fewer white flies in the field that we sampled, which suggests that keeping things diverse keeps the white fly population down for some reason. So my summary slides there, which I can't get all the way through in my um, 21 minutes. Um, but um, merging, our, uh, merging our conservation practices with um, how we go about doing it is important for, for keeping that biodiversity there to basically do these jobs for us. There's a lot of biodiversity out there doing stuff for us. Here's our team. And I'm not sure if I have, everyone stayed awake, so this slide doesn't. Uh, <coughs> if we have any questions, I'll take some, uh, get his things. Any questions for Jason? All right, concentrate. Huh? Yeah. You know, with the rising of uh, solar panels going on, I mean, being implemented in the state of Georgia, have there been any work done on the impact of the beneficial or insects in general? Because you just wiped out whether it be native, you know, host to you know the uh, insects. This. This is a really good question, you know, and I actually should have put that in a proposal. Um, I'm working with a, with a team, is it working out to do it? I'm working with a, a team um, that gets, it's a pretty large team that is the National Research uh, Laboratory and Environment that has a component that is specifically focused on making solar a multi-dimensional landscape. So it's not just solar, we're not just doing energy there, but should be doing other things. And I don't remember, seen anything in there that actually went for an impact like that, but that's one that we could actually do. But I will tell you this, is that the, the goal of that, that project, the overall project, is to um, research different ways to integrate other things back into that kind of dead electrical space. And one of them will be the things I'm talking about, I'm working on that one, which is that we plant mixtures of, of flowers in there to create kind of a solar prairie. It's still artificial, it's a weird space, but it might offset those losses because at least there's conservation of, um, of plants there. But they're trying to do farming and everything there. You can think about it. Some of the panels, or if you've seen them, we're only this tall. Now think about taking your big equipment through there. That's one issue. I'll, I'll stop though because I'm going to way over do it. Let me do this. But uh, stay tuned on that one. I'll, I'll share maybe something next, next time around. The impact. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm Philip Robertson. We're going to just talk a little bit about insect pest management and conservation of beneficial insects is one of the pillars of how we manage insects, right? And uh, anyway, I got a couple things to share with you, but first, uh,
may go a cappella. <laughs> For me. First, uh, just as a little reminder, uh, each year we do do two scout schools, one in Tipton. It's always the first Monday in June. And we do one in Midville, second Tuesday in June. We've pretty much settled in on those dates over the years. Uh, myself and Dr. Mark Abney work together on that, and we'll spend half a day talking about scouting cotton, peanuts, as well as soybean. So if you're interested in that, we'd love to have you. Um, also, we do do a, a little video update or audio update. Uh, Syngenta sponsors this, but if you sign up, we do little pest alerts every couple of weeks. Or if, if there was something serious, we do it more frequently. Uh, but you can do that. And also, my colleagues in Auburn, Dr. Scott Graham, so if you're on the western side of the state, you can sign up for his update. Jeremy Green at Clemson uh, in South Carolina. Uh, he provides an update too. So one of the first things I want to talk to you about today is, is just some concerns I have, and, and I just call them poor earworm concerns. And I'll preface that if we look back over time, we haven't had a poor earworm problem in cotton since we began planting Bolgar II. Everybody agree with that? I mean, we haven't. And that's been a long time. You have to go back to probably 2010. I think it was the last year we planted 555. When we planted 555, we sprayed corn earworm in that cotton. And it wasn't uncommon at all. But I have some concerns, and I just want to share some information with you uh, relative to BT cottons and also relative to pyrethroid susceptibility. So one of the things we do every year is we'll plant non-BT cotton, two gene cottons, and three gene BT cottons. We do it at Midville Plains and Tiffin. And we done this now for five or six years. Now, again, we haven't had high corn airworm pressure, but one of the things we do is right before harvest, we'll go in and count these worm damaged bowls at the end of the year. Now, everyone should know that once a bowl is 10 days of age, it doesn't matter if a worm drills or you take a drill hit out there and drill a bowl, it's not dropping off the plant. So we can quantify how much injury occurred. Then what we can do, if we do it in the two gene cottons and the three gene cottons, we can calculate a percent reduction in damage, or a percent control, so to speak. You with me? So we've been doing that for, for several years, and one of the things we noticed is the two gene cottons, like the Bolgar II, we saw a dip in control this past year. And that has occurred in other parts of the country, all right? You go to the Mid-South, for example, or even up into the Carolinas, North Carolina in particular. They're really struggling, and they're spraying a lot of magicore type products on Bolgar II kinds. Now, our 3 gene, we're still up there, 95 plus. It's all a little dip. I don't know what that is. But that's a little concerning. And again, we've had low pressure, but these are the numbers that showed up, okay? Just want to share that with you. Now, we had an interesting thing happen this year. It was a single field. All right, this is a, a old guard three field. And this happened in an isolated field in Georgia this year, but you need to be aware of it. Because I think we all, including myself, we've all got a little comfortable with how good old guard three is, right? I mean, we have. And it's not bulletproof, and this was an eye-opening experience. Uh, when we went into this field, I mean, there were corn earworms everywhere. And one of the first things we needed to do was make sure it's a bold R3 field. It took a few days, but we did confirm it to be bold R3. Brandon, we walked in this field, pulled 100 balloons, and we found 48 worms. I hadn't seen that in a long time, since a long, long time. It was kind of concerning. Most of the caterpillars were in the balloons. Why are they in the balloons? Typically, there's lower BT expression in a bloom, so they'll tend to get there to avoid feeding on some of that BT. But a lot of corn earworms in that field. We saw flared squares a long time since I've walked in the field and just saw squares flared open with a worm hole in it. Um, we saw feeding on bowls. This was very early in bloom. Okay? 
But what I want you to understand, and I've shown this slide many times, I'll stand up and say none of these BT cottons are immune from corn earworm, but I can say it with a whole lot more confidence than that. So the point here is make sure you have somebody checking your cotton. Um, I don't anticipate us having a problem with a bone guard three cotton this upcoming year, uh, but I am a little concerned about our bone guard two. Um, you know, we don't plant a lot of bone guard two, but there is still 1646, I guess, planted on a fair amount of acres. But we need to make sure we're watching that closely and you're staying in tune with folks. Um, the other thing we often forget is we don't even talk about tobacco bud worm on cotton anymore. But, I mean, it's 100% on tobacco bud worm. It's incredible. But uh, anyway, we, we're, we're losing some, some efficacy with the Bolgar 2. And one of the reasons why that first gene that's in Bolgar 2 and Bolgar 3, <coughs> Corn airworms are several thousand fold resistance to that first gene. So Bogar 2 is actually operating like a one gene cotton. Bogar 3 is acting like a two gene cotton now. Okay? So this problem field, what happened? Again, it was one field. Would you find a few worms scattered around in the area, but not much? If we have a problem field, and this is important, so if you know of a problem field or have a problem field, uh, we need to get a collection of those insects so we can do these laboratory assays to see if they develop resistance. Okay? So we did that for this field, problem field. Everything came back susceptible. That's good news, right? But what happened? So in my opinion, for some reason, if you think about a plant, that's making these VT toxins. For some reason, something went wrong for a few days. And I personally believe they're just one, making toxin for a small window. All the VT cottons are designed to kill stuff when they hatch. So if you think about it, it's been a long time since we've had to deal with corn earworm, but I don't get concerned with the corn earworm until it gets about a quarter inch long. But if the corn earworm's a quarter inch, it doesn't matter if it's Bogart 3 or Bogart 2 or what. He's going to live and feed on that cotton. But I think for some reason we had poor expression. And there just happened to be this massive egg lay. Um, just not explained. Well, a similar observation was made, I believe, in 2018. A couple of locations in Louisiana. Um, again, what I want you to understand, the bottom line here is that Bogart 3 is not bulletproof. Okay? And we just all got a little comfortable. I don't anticipate us having problems next year, but you just need to be aware of what could happen. Any questions on that? What was the date? It was the end of July. So what was that July flight? Yep. That July flight. Never had another problem with that thing. Another question, was there, any, was there a surrounding field that was more susceptible to corn? This was an isolated field, small field, about 10 acres surrounded by woods. We checked other fields that were planted previous and after that field, same variety, same planting day, everything was fine. So what, was the, what was the yield of that? The yield reduction in this field, I would probably say is zero. It was a dry land field. Um, it peaked over a thousand pounds. It peaked over, is it Seth? Uh, Seth's county agent in Terrell County, so that's where the field was. It peaked over a thousand pounds. So again, when this happened, it happened about the first week of bloom because we didn't really quantify bowl damage because there's only blooms and maybe a bowl on the plant every now and then. But if you went back and looked at that cotton, and me and Seth, how many times we looked at that field? Eight or nine? At least. We looked at it at least. If you looked at that field when it was ready to harvest, if you look close, you'd say there's a problem because the, the first fruit node had zero. And the second fruit node had not much, but after that, just you and cotton. So the yield loss was zero. If you'd have been in the third week of bloom, the yield loss would have been significant. Okay? Was there anything different about the actual worm? Nothing different. They came back susceptible. I think it was an expression problem. But that's just Anyone ever looked into what might impact the expression? So that's been debated before. And there's been instances where we 
think there was an expression problem. It has been from drought stress before. It has been from moisture stress, which is still drought stress. When it's tried, when they've tried to repeat that in a controlled environment, they can't repeat it. It's hard to know. It's hard to know. But everything looks normal. It's just some weird, creep thing. It said that these people would have seen it. It makes you think. <coughs> makes you think just seeing your pictures. <coughs> what was interesting, I won't say who the consultant was that found the field. It was an interesting message he left on my phone. <laughs> I could tell it was serious. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just a little more on corn earworms. I'll talk to you a little bit about pyrethroids. And, uh, You know, I've been here, what'd you say, eight years? I've been here eight years, too. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> back in 2006, we started testing susceptibility of pyrethroid insecticides, or corneal pyrethroid insecticides. The way we do that, we take five micrograms of cypermethrin. That's an old ammo, y'all remember that? The old pyrethroid. We use the same thing for years. This is done in a lot of states. We catch some moths and some pheromone traps, put them in a little glass vial that's treated with that dose of pyrethroid, right? Put those moths in there, and the next day we look for mortality. All right. Now, this was developed just to track susceptibility. The more survival, in theory, the higher the resistance, or more difficult they're going to be to control in the field. I've shown this before. Some of you have seen it, but in 2007, I know for a fact we were having problems killing corn ear worms. That's when we were 555. I'll never forget it. I was in a field in Seminole County. It had been sprayed three times in 13 days. <laughs> and we collected insects to send off to get tested for resistance. And they were resistant to pyrethroids. That was uh, several years ago. But the thing that concerns me is when we were doing these vial tests back then, we had 29% survival. And basically, the last seven or eight years, we've exceeded that, so something's changed, right? We saw something changing right here. So same data, but one of the things we did, we started doubling the rate of pyrethroid would get a higher dose. And that's real concerning. That looks like it's going up. Do you agree? So we're putting twice the rate, and, you know, we're at 28% survival this past year. So... Now it's time for y'all to answer a question. If you think about pyrethroids, we've used a lot of them. We use a lot of them on St. Bugs, right? Do we ever spray uh, pyrethroids for uh, corn airworm in any crop? Not intentionally. So, we're, why are we seeing this change in their susceptibility over time? Well, they don't kill you. Hmm? Well, they don't kill you. They just wrong. Well, but where are they being exposed to? They're not being exposed to a pyrethroid on cotton, are they? Do you think? Why are they exposing corn? All right, y'all look at this right here. Looks like that. Looks like something changes where I just put that line up there. All right, so I'll give to you. I think selection is occurring in corn. But don't you think something changed? to the left of this yellow line, to the right of that yellow line? Would y'all agree? It looks like to me, right? What changed? Hmm? Good morning. No, uh, we're talking about pyrethroids. <coughs> what do we spray on pyrethroids? What do we spray stink bugs with in corn today? Pyrethroid. Pyrethroid. What do you think we spray stink bugs with, for the most part, prior to... 2013 and earlier, what do we often use? Meth what? Methoparathon. Meth 2013 is the last year we used methoparathon. What do you think? And this is just kind of an important point, is that we lose these products. We don't think about potential consequences. And I think that's where we're selecting for this pyrethroid resistance. Continue to get 
the, yeah, uh -huh. even if they're in cotton, but they're coming in pretty slate. The other thing, the vast majority of corn earworms in the U.S. funnel through corn here in July. Very high percentage of all the corn earworms in the state of Georgia funnel through corn. All right, time to ask another question. Talk a little bit about changes in BT susceptibility. Anybody want to take a guess where we're selecting for corn earworm resistance to BTs? Corn. And also cotton too, but corn primarily. You need to think about that. All right? You need to think about that. So, let's just kind of wrap this corn earworm thing up. Power resource three bucks an acre. If they don't work, what are we going to do? Right here. <laughs> and you know, when one day we're going to be in a situation where we're spraying caterpillars and we die, that may be 25 years from now, or maybe it's never. But we can't just go out there and dust the top of that plant with insecticide. We've got to make sure we do a good job of application. I'm not saying we're going to get to a problem next year, but if we do, we've got to think about little things. We're going to recommend you stick with the high rethroid, but it will be very, we will be very quick to, to change our recommendation. You're going to have to go to a batch of four type product to see each element. Um, there's some other non pyrethroids and they're broken out in the pest management handbook. So with that, um, I believe we're getting selection for pyrethroid resistance and BTs in corn. Look, if you got to spray stink bugs in corn, you got to spray your pyrethroid. You don't have any other options. In terms of BT, if you're corn farming, please plant a refuge. Um, I'd also discourage you from planting that dip gene in corn. Why well, select for that third gene? Okay. There's a lot of corn earworms to be in there. Again, if we don't have the populations in the field, we're never going to see these problems. These problems are probably out there. But if we keep doing good things, you know, if you don't have a threshold level of insects, it don't matter. And what are these good things that we do? Conserve beneficial insects. You know, white flies has really got our attention. So we're back in the game of thinking about conserving a whole lot more than we used to. But I ask questions to myself, why are corn airworm populations low in Georgia compared to Mississippi or North Carolina? And one obvious thing, it's a cotton corn ratio. We're five at four X cotton acres to corn acres. We dilute them corn airworms out of the cotton. The other thing, maybe it's coincidence, but where they're spraying a lot of corn airworms on Bogart too right now, they spray a lot of plant bugs. Maybe not cause and effect, there's definitely a cor correlation. They not have data for cause and effect, but I'm going to tell you, there is cause. You spray plant bugs and start killing beneficials over a large percentage of our landscape in June, prior to bloom, we're asking for problems. And so our beneficial insects only spray threshold, uh, only spray when thresholds are exceeded. They work. Absolutely, there are fields that need to be treated for plant bugs in the state of Georgia. Absolutely. 2021, we sprayed 30% of the acres, higher than we ever have before. This past year, we probably dropped down about 10. More normal. If you have a problem spraying, if you don't, that's what the beneficial insects stay in the field. A couple comments on Thrive On. You've heard of it. New trait developed by Bayer, targeted tarnished plant bugs. We've been looking at this product now for several years. It's not a silver bullet on plant bugs. It's a tool in other parts of the uh, cotton belt where they're spraying plant bugs five and six times a, a year. In those same environments, they're going to spray three or four times. So it's a tool. It's going to bring some value to us on plant bugs. Uh, we've got to do a lot of figuring out on what it does for us when we don't have to spray a lot of plant bugs. The other pest it, it has good activity on is thrips. It's incredible, all right? Just amazing technology. Um, 
We've never seen, we've been looking at this uh, technology since 2018. We looked at it on a lot of grower fields last year. It's very consistent, and it's just near perfect thrips control. It is what it is. All right, I want to, only got like a couple minutes. I got to touch on white flies. And, uh, so a lot of you are aware that we run these little steep cards. And this is just data. We run them every week. And I'm just showing three years of data. And this is how many white flies are stuck on that card each week, okay? That yellow line is 2022. 2021, we never caught me. Why, why did we not have white flies in 2021? It rained every day, right? <clears throat> but if you just look at this fall, that yellow line is a lot higher than 2021, 2022, or 2020. Great. <clears throat> 41 back here, we put a lot of white flies into winter crops, into overwintering host plants, mostly brassica plants, broccoli, collards, kale. At high populations of black flies going into this winter. We're fortunate we have some really cold temperatures. Okay, it's good. The most common question I've gotten so far is did we kill the white flies? Yeah, we killed some. The only information I can find, we know that if it gets below 21 degrees for three hours, we kill 90% of the adults. We did that. Agreed? Everybody in this room, we got down below 21 for three, three hours. To kill immatures, those little bitty ones, that big eye bugs like a feed on, and pirate bugs like a feed on, and little wasp like a sting. The immatures, we need to be at 21 or below for 57 hours. We didn't do that. That's consecutive, consecutive hours. We didn't do that. We killed a lot of hosts. When you drive by edges of road, I mean, it's brown. There's a lot of these hosts over the last several years we haven't killed in the wintertime. So I'm optimistic about where we're going. I'm optimistic about what we did with white flies. And I'm also real. Okay? It was cold in some certain spurs. All of you are familiar with DD60s, right? And how cotton grows. What this shot, slide is illustrating is, is DD52s. This tracks white fly development, just like we can track cotton growth. We can track white fly development, and it's a DD52. This is data going back to 2004. Maybe it's coincidence, but the, the, the five years where we sprayed the most cotton for white flies are the five years which had the highest cumulative white fly degree days. Right? That's where we are right now. On April 1st, the county is going to have an updated chart, and let's hope that yellow line for 2022 is kind of down here. Okay? Then I'll be feeling really good about where we are with white flies. But I still have a little caution because it's, it's been a mild winter, except when it's cold. <laughs> And the last thing, then we'll have any questions. Uh, we're out of time, but uh, irregardless, there's three things you as a grower can do, and we're going to update that chart on April 1st because there's three things you can do right here. And I think April 1st is the latest you can possibly do it. You're going to plant a smooth leaf variety, hopefully. That's what we want to do to reduce white fly risk. But these two things, every grower in here, every agent, every consultant, you know farms, which are at higher risk from white flies. Every year they get more white flies. And it's probably due to proximity to a source of white flies. How close are we to a source of white flies to move to this field? How close are we to a kettle or a water running field, a cucumber field, whatever it is. But even if white flies are low, why not still think about placing or vary in planting dates, plant those areas that are at high risk and near some source, plant them early. Or don't plant them late. It just makes sense. Even if we don't have any white flies, it could be the difference in not spraying at all and having to make one spray on a light year. On a bad year, it could be 
can be tough, Scott. Uh, it can be the difference in on a bad year spraying twice versus spraying four times. So anyway, that's what I had. Uh, myself and Jason uh, will be here uh, for a few minutes. Uh, one thing uh, before you go, there are some pesticide forms uh, up here. There's also some of the registration desks, four hours commercial, one hour private. Four hours commercial, pretty good, so I'd probably sign up. I'm going to sign up. <coughs> All right, thank you all for coming. Enjoy the rest of the day. And I'll, yeah, go ahead with questions. The trial with the drive on variety, did you apply that with Ag Logic or, or just Ortane and Nano? That was more thing than not or thing. And, and basically, what we were trying to we we planted Thrive on it six different times. And I just wanted to see it for myself that we would never have to spray Thrive on with Thorthane. And that's what it showed. But we do have data with and without Ag Logic. Ag Logic brings nothing to the table in terms of thrips control when Thrive on is used. It brings nothing. I mean, this technology is really good. It doesn't necessarily kill the thrips, they just don't want to be there. And it's all about injury. So we're not going to count thrips on our hand and make a decision to spray. We're going to look at, at how that plant's actually growing. But several folks in here have seen it. And Seth, Scott, who else? Jeremy? Anybody else with some thought? You seen Jay? Brandon? It's a real deal. All right. I got a question yeah. for you. So if you go back, you know, a couple of years ago, to me, I mean, it seemed with the introduction of Ag Logic uh, or Alcar, and uh, I don't know if people grow it or spray it more for thrift earlier, but to me, in my area that I cover, spider mite seems to be progressively getting worse and more prominent in fields, not necessarily to treatable levels, but their presence is there more so than they had, say, five years ago. Yep. No, no question. No question about it. I mean, we put a foliar spray, and, and you know, optimal time to buy on a seed tree is about that first leaf, Brandon. It's not the third or fourth leaf when we're coming over to the top of the If you want to protect the cotton, you need to spray it early. The other reason we want to spray it early is because the later we get in time, we're disrupting it. But that orthane spray is not helping the spider mite situation. One bit. Agologic has activity on spider mites for about ten weeks after you plant it. But it has activity on beneficial. Well, well yeah. That, well, you can make that argument. On the yeah. But, uh, you know, in terms of spider mites, you know, a lot of, we're going back to strip to a lot. Make sure you get that crop killed. When spider mites going to eat you up, if you have spider mites on hen or something out there, and that hen bit dies when that cotton comes up, guess where all those mites from hen bit are coming. So make sure everything's dead when the cotton is planted.